people have gazed up at the birds and dreamed of conquering the air. Of freeing themselves from the natural limits that bind them to the earth. From kites to gliders, to the first sustained flight in an airplane, every step was a journey into the unknown. That vast and undiscovered country which inspires humankind to seek new frontiers, no matter what the cost. Further, faster, higher. Each new aeronautical concept was born of a vision to try something that had never been tried before and might never succeed. And as the boundaries of flight were pushed above and beyond the limits of the past, so too were the limits of human endurance, bravery, and imagination. Every stage in this never-ending quest was marked by trial and error, failure and success, tragedy, and heroism. Revolutionary ideas were embodied in experimental aircraft of strange and wondrous design. Some of these planes, like the Northrop Flying Wing, were meant to be prototypes for a totally new kind of airplane. Others, like the record-breaking series of X-planes, that flew out of Edwards Air Force Base in California, were built to achieve a specific goal or as a test bed for a new aeronautical concept. But no matter why they were made, all these aircraft had one thing in common. They were all pioneering efforts to expand the horizons of flight. The designers and pilots who built and flew these incredible machines took huge risks in their pursuit of the unknown. They often sacrificed everything they had, their reputations, their careers, even their lives, to prove that their creations could do what no other plane had done before. They were the visionaries, and it was on the wings of their dreams that some of the greatest aircraft of all time took flight. One of the most far-sighted of these visionaries was a gifted American aircraft designer, a man whose single-minded belief in a radical concept drove him to pursue a dream so ahead of its time that it took nearly a generation for the rest of the aeronautical world to catch up. His name was Jack Northrop. Northrop began his aviation career as an engineer with the newly formed Lockheed Company during World War I working on seaplanes. In 1926, he designed the famous Lockheed Vega, a highly streamlined and rugged single-engine plane which was flown by world-renowned aviators Wiley Post and Amelia Earhart, and which also set a new world's altitude record of 55,000 feet. With this challenge behind him, Northrop soon moved to Douglas Aircraft, where he created the Northrop Alpha, the direct ancestor of the legendary DC-3. But although Jack Northrop was gaining a reputation for innovation in the design of traditional aircraft, he had for years been fascinated by the concept of a flying wing, a radical type of plane with no fuselage or tail. In a conventional aircraft, the wings generate the lift that keeps the plane in the air. The rest of the structure, fuselage, rudder, and stabilizer, carry cargo and help steer the plane, but provide no lift. A flying wing, on the other hand, devotes nearly all of its surface area to generating lift while at the same time eliminating the appendages that create drag. Theoretically, these features produce extremely high efficiency, which give the flying wing greater range and load-carrying capability, while also requiring less power than a more orthodox plane of the same size. On paper, it was a superior aircraft, but as a practical flying machine, it was totally unproven. Still to Northrop, the wing was as near to perfection as any aircraft design could be. He became obsessed with the idea of filling the skies with these elegant and graceful creations. Jack Northrop wasn't the only one to glimpse the promise of the wing. Since the 1870s, other designers around the world had proposed a series of schemes, and some of these strange craft were even built. But in the 1930s, Northrop, the man who was to take the flying wing to greater heights than anyone else, was still working on conventional airplanes. Then, 
In 1938, Northrop left Douglas and formed his own company. After a shaky start, he finally landed a contract to build dive bombers for Great Britain. The contract gave Northrop enough capital to build his first experimental flying wing, the N1M. A plane of unusual interest is demonstrated at Rosamond Dry Lake in the Mojave Desert. It is the latest model of the Northrop flying wing. Developed from designs originated by Mr. Northrop in 1923, this bat-like plane is devised to use all its surface for useful lift. The elimination of non-lift elements such as tail and fuselage is what does the trick. The Northrop Corporation estimates that general application of this principle would result in speed increase up to 100 miles an hour with no extra power. And it is thought that this design will make construction 30 to 40 percent cheaper. It may revolutionize airplane engineering. We believe that we have solved most of the problems connected with the development of the flying wing and that this type of plane will have considerable problems for future use. For Jack Northrup, the quest for pure flight had begun. 1939, when the Army Air Corps announced a proposal which called for unconventional designs for a new fighter, Northrop was ready. His submission, the XP-56 Black Bullet, was his first attempt to produce a practical flying wing. Utilizing all that he had learned from the N1M, Northrop's XP-56 was powered by tandem pusher propellers that revolved in opposite directions. But most significantly, it was essentially a flying wing with a tiny vertical tail fin and a ventral rudder. It was first flown on September 30th, 1943. But the test model was lost when it flipped over during a high-speed ground run. Though a highly modified second wing achieved some success, it failed to meet the military's design specifications. With the successful performance of conventional fighters like the P-51 Mustang, the Army decided that there was little value in developing such a radical aircraft. While building the XP-56, Northrop was also working on combining a liquid-fueled rocket engine with the flying wing airframe. Designated XP-79, three of these super-secret wings were ordered. So advanced was the concept that even the methods of construction like welding magnesium had to be invented. It was also decided that one of the aircraft would be powered by jet engines. While problems with the rocket engine caused this part of the program to be canceled, the jet version proceeded. This plane featured a retractable tricycle landing gear system and a prone control position which would theoretically allow the pilot to withstand up to 14 times the force of gravity during high-speed turns. After a long series of ground runs, the aircraft was finally flown on September 12, 1945. With Jack Northrop looking on, test pilot Harry Crosby took off and flew for 14 minutes, performing graceful maneuvers over Muroc Dry Lake in California. The aircraft was at 7,000 feet, when suddenly it is believed to have suffered a failure in its control system. At 2,000 feet and unable to recover, Crosby bailed out, but was struck by the airframe. He never opened his parachute. Both the pilot and the aircraft were lost. The program already beset with major delays and poor flight performance was soon canceled by the Air Force. But Northrop's dream was still alive. He was already at work on a larger and more ambitious flying wing. At the beginning of World War II, when it appeared that Great Britain might be conquered by Germany, the U.S. Army Air Corps asked for proposals for a new heavy bomber with a range of 10,000 miles carrying a payload of five tons of bombs. Northrop's proposal, a flying wing, was designated the XB-35. It was 172 feet wide, propelled by four contra-rotating propellers, like those that powered the XP-56. The aircraft featured many of the ideas from earlier Northrop flying wings, including a tailless construction. But the lack of a normal tail created significant problems in controlling yaw, the tendency of the nose to swing right and left. The available control system could not be modified to allow the pilot to position his aircraft for precise bombing accuracy. 
when several of the airframes were modified to accept jet engines and designated the YV-49, the future suddenly looked bright for Northrop's dream. The Air Force ordered 30 modified versions for reconnaissance. Designated the YRB-49, the program appeared to go well, with exhaustive testing and painstaking labor, gradually finding and fixing the plane's control problems. On June 5, 1948, pilot Glenn Edwards and his crew took off in one of the YB-49s for a flight to test aircraft stability. Everything apparently had gone smoothly, as Edwards radioed that he was returning to Muroc Air Base. A few minutes later, the YB-49 suffered a structural failure in one side of its wing. It disintegrated in the air, crashing just north of the town of Mojave. Everyone aboard was killed. It was a devastating setback for Northrop and his flying wings. The Air Force was becoming skeptical, but Northrop and others had no doubt that the YB-49's problems could be overcome. Northrop even launched a full-scale promotional campaign to try and sell the wing as a passenger plane. Now, a preview of the flying wing transport of tomorrow. The midsection provides ample room for 80 passengers. The spaciousness keynotes the luxurious main lounge, extending 53 feet inside the wing. And future air travelers will really see something. Through the plexiglass windows of the front wing edge, Passengers have an unimpaired view of the Earth, unrolling thousands of feet below. Coast-to-coast -coast flights in four hours may not be too far away. The dorsal tip of the plane provides an excellent vantage point to see the world go by. Snug as bugs in their magic carpet, air travelers can look down on mere Earthlings as the double quartet of mighty turbojets whistle them through space. Despite these efforts, in November of 1949, in what is still considered a highly controversial decision with serious political overtones, the Secretary of the Air Force, Stuart Symington, not only canceled the B-49 programs in favor of the piston-engined Convair B-36, but also directed the destruction of every B-49 in existence. In the saddest moment of Jack Northrop's career, he was forced to order his workers to cut up the extraordinary aircraft for which he had worked so long and hard and sell the pieces for scrap. Thirty years of effort had amounted to nothing more than a dusty heap of aluminum in the desert. Northrop was a broken man, feeling personally responsible for the failure of the wing he resigned from his company in November of 1952. Jack Northrop never worked in aviation again. As Northrop's quest to expand the frontiers of flight appeared to be ending, another series of pioneering efforts was just getting underway. Ironically, the focal point of these record-breaking flights was the very same airbase where the XB-49 carrying Glenn Edwards had crashed. It was here at Muroc later renamed Edwards Air Force Base in Glen Edwards' honor, that some of the most advanced planes ever created shattered more barriers in a briefer span than at any previous time in the history of aviation. These were the aircraft of the legendary X-Series. The origins of the X-Series were found in a set of problems that surfaced in the high-performance fighter aircraft that took to the skies during World War II. Early in 1941, Army test pilot Cigna Gilkey was testing a new Lockheed P-38 in a high-speed dive. As the airspeed increased, the nose of the aircraft tried to tuck under, and the rudder and elevator shook violently. Gilkey reduced power and gradually flew the aircraft out of the dive. After a thorough investigation, Lockheed personnel, including the P-38's designer, the legendary Kelly Johnson, discovered that this extraordinarily sleek aircraft was encountering new and unsuspected aerodynamic phenomena as it approached higher speeds. They called it compressibility effects. Another P-38 was modified with a boosted elevator system and Lockheed test pilot Ralph Verdon took the aircraft up for further high-speed dive tests. At just over 530 knots, the tail broke away and the aircraft spun inverted into the ground, killing Verdon. 
the P-38 and other high-performance fighters of the time were encountering what would become known as the transonic range, where the air passing over the wing can exceed the speed of sound. As this air mixes with the slower subsonic air passing under the wing, it creates turbulence which acts upon the tail surfaces of the aircraft, causing the controls to respond unpredictably. In many cases, it took the pilots full strength just to keep the controls from moving by themselves. Sometimes, aerodynamic forces in the transonic range could cause the tail of the aircraft to fail. This is what happened to Verdon's P-38. As aircraft speeds increased during the 1940s, compressibility effects became more and more of a problem. The severe buffeting which beset planes as they inched closer to the speed of sound, or Mach 1, convinced some investigators that there was an actual sound barrier. But what was the sound barrier? Speculation grew wide and fanciful. Some theorists suggested it was an invisible wall in the sky into which aircraft would crash. Others even thought that a pilot's voice would get stuck in his throat, or that time would reverse itself, and the pilot could emerge from supersonic flight younger than when he entered it. No one really knew for certain, but in the United States and elsewhere, a number of dedicated scientists realized that unless this sound barrier could be overcome, Aviation was just about at the end of its ability to advance. The chief obstacle they faced was that research was limited by existing aircraft. In order for an aircraft at that time to gain enough speed to enter the transonic range, it had to dive from a very high altitude and begin its pullout high enough to regain normal flight before hitting the ground. The entire maneuver took about 70 seconds, leaving only moments to gather data. It soon became obvious to the aviation industry and to NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NASA's predecessor, that further study of the effects of compressibility was going to be limited by the brief time that propeller-driven aircraft could achieve and maintain transonic speeds. Thus, the requirement for an aircraft which could achieve this speed in straight and level flight was equally obvious. Two teams of designers and engineers were set to work to create aircraft which could explore and, it was hoped, conquer these aerodynamic limits. The first team, aligned with the Bell Aircraft Company, created the XS-1, which became famous as the X-1, the first of the great X-planes. Great care was taken in the X-1 to minimize risks to the pilot. To reduce the danger of tail failure, the X-1 was designed with a thinner tail mounted above the wake from the straight wing. This would allow the tail to maintain its efficiency after the wing had begun to experience the transonic effects of compressibility. To avoid the dangers of relying on a rocket engine for the critical takeoff phase of the flight, it was decided to air launch the X-1 from a specially modified B-29. This would also reduce the prodigious amount of fuel that would be required for the gas-guzzling rocket to take off from the ground. Another feature of the aircraft was that the entire horizontal tail could be trimmed in addition to the normal elevator it had. This idea was the prototype for the stabilators used on many later high-performance jets. Captain Charles E. Chuck Yeager, a 24-year-old fighter pilot and graduate of the Army's test pilot course, was selected to fly the X-1. Jaeger had been a double ace during World War II, shooting down a total of 11 enemy aircraft, including five on a single mission. He had earned the Distinguished Flying Cross, two Silver Stars, the Bronze Star, and seven Air Medals. In the arena of air combat, Jaeger was unquestionably one of the hottest pilots in the world. But it was in the precise and rigid realm of test flying where his true brilliance would ultimately shine through. Flying from Yurok Air Force Base, Jaeger and the X-1 team proceeded carefully, gradually increasing the speed by 10 to 20 knots until the eighth flight. On October 10, 1947, Jaeger achieved Mach 0.997, the very edge of the sound barrier. But after arcing over at 45,000 feet while on his descent, the interior of the windshield became coated with frost, which Jaeger could not scrape off. The two chase pilots flew alongside and talked him down to a blind landing. After the data from the instruments and ground tracking sites was examined by the engineers, 
It was decided that the next flight would be the attempt to surpass Mach 1. Four days later, on October 14th, Jaeger climbed down into the cockpit of the X-1. Now named Glamorous Glennis after his wife. Because of two ribs broken in a horseback ride the night before, he had to use a sawed-off broom handle to lock his canopy. Then Jaeger began his checklist. To prevent the windshield from frosting over as it had on the earlier flight, it was coated with shampoo, a simple but extremely effective solution to the problem. At 10,000 feet, the B-29 released the X-1. Jaeger lit off the four-chamber rocket motor, accelerated and climbed away. During the climb, Jaeger tested control response as the speed crept toward Mark 1, a speed of sound. Shutting down two chambers of the rocket motor, he felt only light buffeting and control instability, all of which were easily handled with the stabilizer. The X-1's design to overcome compressibility was working. Above Mach 0.97, elevator control was regained and the flight smoothed out. At 42,000 feet, Jaeger reignited the third chamber of the rocket motor. He and glamorous Glennis soared past the speed of sound leaving the first great period in the age of flight behind. It's passing marked by a double sonic boom and a dissipating white contrail curving in the sky. As Jaeger shut down the motors and glided to Earth, he noticed that the same control phenomena occurred in reverse order as the aircraft decelerated, proving that the cautious approach and painstaking work had paid off. As for reaching the sound barrier, in his matter-of-fact way, Jaeger said, I was kind of disappointed that it wasn't more of a big charge than it was. NACA Chief of Research Hugh Dryden said later, This achievement brings to public attention the power of a new tool, the research airplane, in obtaining the basic aeronautical knowledge crucial to the design of military aircraft of outstanding performance. What Dryden didn't add was that lessons learned by the series of X-planes would benefit all of aviation. While the X-1 was destroying the myth of the sound barrier, another design team from Douglas Aircraft was creating the jet-powered D-558-1 Skystreak. Because of the jet engines, the Skystreak could be operated from the ground with much longer flight times than the X-1 could achieve. While the X-1 was exploring supersonic flight, NACA used the Skystreak extensively to study flight in the transonic range. On May 3, 1948, Howard Lilly took the aircraft for a routine test mission. But shortly after the Sky Street got airborne, the engine compressor disintegrated, sending small parts at the speed of bullets into the engine compartment. Several vital control cables were cut. The aircraft slid into the desert floor, exploding into flames. Howard Lilly was killed instantly. The first NACA test pilot to die in the line of duty. Tragically. He would not be the last. During the development of the Sky Streak, the design was modified into an air-launched, swept-wing version known as the D-558-2 Skyrocket. What emerged was a totally new aircraft, one of the main prototypes for later swept-wing jets. The Skyrockets, powered by both jet and rocket engines, became the workhorses of aircraft development for years to come. In fact, most of the early data on swept-wing performance in the trans and supersonic ranges came from the Skyrockets. During testing, it quickly became evident that in a high-speed swept-wing aircraft, there was a great deal of danger with pitch control problems, the nose suddenly or uncontrollably moving up or down. So the tail surfaces had to be lowered. This feature proved to be very useful in enhancing low-speed handling characteristics and was later incorporated into two of the great supersonic fighters of the 50s, the Air Force's F-100 Super Sabre and the Navy's F-8 Crusader. A second model Skyrocket was modified by removing the jet engine and increasing the fuel capacity of the rocket engine. On one of these tests, the pilot, Bill Bridgman of Douglas Aircraft, saw his fuel pressure drop with about a minute to go before launch and called for an abort, shutting down his systems as he did. But no one heard his transmission. 
As the chase plane pilot counted down to the drop, Bridgman frantically tried to turn everything back on. The aircraft was released, and as it was dropping like a stone toward the ground, he finally got the engine to light. Flying on through a now uneventful mission, Bridgman entered Edwards Air Force Base legend by transmitting, Damn it, George. I told you not to drop me. In June of 1950, a new test pilot joined the program. Scott Crossfield had begun flying just before the outbreak of World War II and was an engineering student at the time of Pearl Harbor. Fed up with the slow pace of the Army's flight training program, Crossfield transferred to the Navy and finished the war as an F-6 Hellcat pilot aboard the light carrier USS Langley. After the war, he returned to school, earning his master's degree in aeronautical engineering and joining NACA the same month. Crossfield was almost immediately checked out in the X-1. His amazing skills and legendary calm were evident on his first mission. Before the flight, the ground crew had set the stabilizer incorrectly. As the X-1 dropped away from the B-29 launch aircraft, it pitched up, stalled, and rolled onto its back. Crossfield recovered the X-1, rolling it back upright and readjusted the stabilizer. While the amazed chase pilot watched, he lit off the rocket engine and continued the mission. Later transferring to the Skyrocket program, his superb skills were displayed even further. On November 20th, 1953, Crossfield in the Skyrocket became the first pilot to surpass Mark II. The Skyrocket program continued until 1957, each flight gaining another piece of knowledge and pushing the experimental frontier just a little further. No one was ever heard in the Skyrocket project. And although Jaeger and the X-1 became more famous, the Skyrocket, with its swept-wing design, had the most long-term influence, serving as one of the main forerunners of the swept-wing jets that followed. Appropriately, these two great aircraft rest next to one another in the Smithsonian. Jaeger and the X-1 team weren't about to sit still while the Skyrocket broke all their records. A new version of the X-1, the X-1A, was built specifically to match the speeds attained by their rivals. In December 1953, with Chuck Yeager again in the cockpit, the X-1A was launched for an attempt at Mach 2. It was feared that there might be some control problems at such a high speed, but everything appeared normal as the X-1A soared past the Skyrocket's record. Suddenly, at 70,000 feet, the aircraft snapped into a vicious roll tumbling out of control so violently that Jaeger's helmet slammed against the canopy, cracking it. Passing 40,000 feet, the aircraft entered an inverted spin. At 29,000 feet, Jaeger gradually recovered control and landed safely. Thoroughly beaten up and sounding groggy, Jaeger radioed that if he had had an ejection seat, he would have gotten out. Incredible as it may seem, an ejection seat was simply not considered important. But after Jaeger's near disaster, ejection seats were quickly adopted for all X-1s. Even as the record-breaking duel between the X-1 and Skyrocket continued, the Bell X-2 program began. Designed to attain speeds of up to Mach 3, the X-2 suffered early setbacks. An in-flight explosion while still attached to its B-50 mothership killed both the X-2 pilot and a Bell crewman. After long delays, the X-2 began a series of gradual steps toward Mach 3. On September 7, 1956, Air Force Captain Ivan Kinchlow set a world altitude record by flying the X-2 to 126,000 feet. The mission immediately demonstrated the difficulties of flight in the thin atmosphere of near space. Kinchlow had gone so high that there was not enough air for the controls to be effective. There was no way for Kinchlow to alter the flight path of the aircraft until it had returned to the denser atmosphere below, where the control surfaces once again had something to act upon. It was control instability that had hampered the YB-49 program. And its speeds increased. Engineers and pilots knew, especially after Jaeger's wild ride in the X-1A, that the X-planes were going farther and farther away from whatever safe margins were left. Closer and closer to the point where control of the aircraft would become impossible. 
the ever faster aircraft being built revealed dangerous tendencies in flight, each of which had to be explored and corrected before the next step could be attempted. On September 27, 1956, Air Force test pilot Mel Apt was air launched in the X-2 for an attempt on Mach 3. Test data showed there was a significant danger of loss of control beyond Mach 3.2. Apt was cautioned to slow down quickly if he encountered any control difficulties and to avoid any abrupt control movements near Mach 2.7. The first part of the flight went flawlessly, with Apt and the X-2 reaching Mach 3.2 at 65,000 feet. It will never be known exactly what happened next, but while still above Mach 3, as Apt began a sharp turn back toward Edwards, the X-2 began a series of diverging rolls and then tumbled out of control, ending up in an inverted spin with Apt unconscious in the seat. Apt gradually came to, and realizing that he could not regain control, jettisoned the forward section of the aircraft which formed an escape capsule. The capsule pitched downward, fouling the drogue parachute. Apt was just attempting to bail out of the capsule when it smashed into the ground killing him instantly. These problems of roll divergence which caused the aircraft to tumble out of control continued, as did the efforts to solve them in the X-2. But it was the X-3 flying stiletto which gave the greatest clues to their solution. The X-3 had been built to achieve sustained jet flight at Mach 2. Its needle-like profile and small, thin, low aspect ratio wings gave it the most highly refined supersonic airframe of its day as well as making it one of the most radical-looking planes ever built. But the engines originally planned for the X-3 grew too large to fit in its rakish fuselage, and substitute engines limited the X-3 to transonic speeds only. Yet despite this disappointment, the program produced valuable research data. On one X-3 test flight, pilot Joe Walker was doing some simple roll maneuvers just below Mach 1 when the aircraft began to diverge its nose pitching and yawing without controlled inputs. Walker recovered and decided to try it again. But the second time, at a speed above Mach 1, the aircraft nearly crashed. Since the X-planes carried all varieties of instrumentation, the engineers on the ground used the data they gathered to discover the reasons for the problems, then issued guidelines to prevent subsequent incidents. Much of this information was immediately given to the Air Force for applications in its fighter aircraft programs which were then experiencing losses due to out-of-control situations. Although the X-3 never achieved the speeds for which it had been designed, it still provided important information that expanded the boundaries of aeronautical knowledge. Some of its advanced design features also had far-reaching influence. Data gathered on the X-3's wing design was later incorporated in the F-104 Starfighter, the main NATO interceptor for years. In the early 1950s, while supersonic flight was still being explored, other scientists and engineers began to study the possibility of manned spaceflight using personnel, equipment, and data taken from Nazi Germany's rocketry program. Among the areas which needed to be explored were controllability and stability at hypersonic speeds of Mach 6 and above, construction materials, and methods of landing a spacecraft. In 1954, a contract was won by North American Aircraft to build a plane which would be capable of reaching the edges of space and finding some of the answers. It would have to achieve speeds in excess of 4,100 miles per hour, altitudes of 150,000 feet, and be able to withstand temperatures of up to 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. In other words, its designers needed to come up with a plane that could withstand the heat of a blast furnace while flying over 28 miles high and traveling more than twice as fast as a bullet fired from a high-powered rifle. The new aircraft, named the X-15, was so advanced that even the airspace ranges needed to test it had to be created. Full pilot pressure suits and an ejection system capable of getting the pilot out unharmed at four times the speed of sound had to be developed. The rocket engine which powered it was capable of delivering 57,000 pounds of thrust. And for the first time, this rocket engine had a throttle, giving the pilot full control of its power output. 
Building on data gained in the X2 program, a hydrogen peroxide reaction thrust system was also devised. This allowed the X-15 to maneuver at an altitude where there was no air for normal controls to act upon. After the Soviets launched the first satellite, Sputnik, the X-15 program took on new public importance for the United States. It was as if the reputation of the entire nation rested on the success of the X-15, at least until NASA could get American satellites into orbit. Yet despite the incredible care which the design was given, the early stages of the X-15's flight test program were not without incident. July 8, 1955. On its first test flight, the X-15 began to porpoise almost uncontrollably. Fortunately, pilot Scott Crossfield was able to time the porpoising perfectly, touching down between oscillations so that the aircraft wouldn't cartwheel down the runway. Later, Crossfield was again in the cockpit during a ground test of the rocket engine. At first, everything went according to plan. Then... A pressure regulator malfunction had caused the engine to explode. Miraculously, Crossfield emerged shaken, but unharmed. The X-15's rugged structure and sealed cockpit had saved his life. But from that time forward, all ground tests were run with the pilot seated safely in a blockhouse with the rest of the technicians. November 9th, 1962. Pilot Jack McKay was making the 74th flight of the program when his engine failed to respond to throttle inputs. Push your throttle up and give us chamber pressure. Uh, we don't have chamber pressure, about 200. Roger, you got the full throttle? Uh -huh. You're running at 30%. He immediately shut the engine down and began dumping fuel in preparation for an emergency landing. Roger, uh, you're going by Mud Lake. It looks like a landing at Mud Lake. Wow. But he couldn't complete the process before he began his final approach. The extra weight of the excess fuel on board had caused the main landing gear to collapse. McKay survived the accident, but he suffered a serious spinal injury that forced him into early retirement. Despite these setbacks, the X-15 was a spectacular success, attaining speeds of Mach 6, and altitudes of more than 350,000 feet, or 66 miles. It proved that people could fly out of the Earth's atmosphere, maneuver an aircraft with a control system of reaction thrusters, then re-enter the atmosphere and fly, again with aerodynamic controls to a safe landing. Even the heat-absorbing coatings which later spacecraft used for re-entry were first tested on the X-15. The X-15 program has been described as the most successful flight research program of all time. The data gathered on its 199 flights produced over 750 research papers and reports. And the advances it made helped pave the way for the routine use of space. But all good things eventually come to an end. Having fulfilled or surpassed almost all of its design goals, on December 12, 1968, the X-15 made its last flight. After the X-15, the X-Series continued. As did the quest for new frontiers of flight around the world. And as aeronautical technology advanced, it finally caught up with the dream Jack Northrop had pursued so relentlessly almost a generation before. April 1980. Jack Northrop, 84 years old and in failing health, was invited to visit the company that still bore his name. It had been almost 30 years since the crash of the flying wing that killed Glenn Edwards. In a conference room with senior company officials looking on, Northrop was given a model of a new flying wing. 
the first B-2 stealth bomber. It was a shape derived from his beautiful YB-49. The advent of computer-augmented control systems had solved the wing stability problems, making the design practical. It was a triumph for Northrop's dreams and all the efforts for which he had sacrificed so many years before. As he gazed misty-eyed at the model, Northrop said, Now I know why God has kept me alive. After 40 years, aviation had finally caught up with the vision of Jack Northrop and discovered that he had been right all along. It has been said that over half the sum of human knowledge has been gained in the 20th century. And over three quarters of what we know about aviation has come since the end of World War II. In this vast expansion of our horizons, pioneers like Jack Northrup, Chuck Yeager, and Scott Crossfield led the way. Theirs is a story of courage and sacrifice, of barriers challenged and heroically overcome. A story of triumph in the face of the unknown. A story without end. For the frontiers of flight are as limitless as the boundless vistas of the human imagination.